Okay, so welcome everybody, whether you're here at the Hopkins Nanjing Center or at one of the other size campuses or elsewhere, and whether you're looking at this live this evening or watching the recording subsequently. Um, as uh, many of you know, the Hopkins Nanjing Center has been expanding its coverage of themes involving China and the Global South um, during and since the uh, pandemic. So this topic uh, today fits in that. Um, we've also been uh, making an effort to make more of our events available um, across the, the other size campuses. So this is open virtually, um, whichever continent uh, you're on at the moment. Um, we're very fortunate uh, this evening to have a talk by Eric Olander, who is the um, editor-in-chief of the China Global South uh, Project, um, which is an independent, nonpartisan multimedia news initiative that explores China's engagement in Africa and more broadly throughout the developing world, throughout the Global South. Um, Eric has more than 30 years of journalism experience as an editor, producer, and correspondent with several international news organizations, including CNN, the BBC, uh, Associated Press, and France 24, among others. He's produced radio, television, and digital journalism all over the world, but his main area of expertise is China, where he spent more than a decade um, here in country in academic and professional um, capacities, um, including speaking Chinese uh, fluently. But his interest in Africa also stems from having done an undergraduate degree in East African history at UC Berkeley and an MPA from the University of Hong Kong. So he brings a wide range of expertise to, to this interest. Um, and the China Global South Project, as um, many of you may know, does have a regular posting. I'm actually a subscriber myself, and I was just looking at uh, today's posting, uh, I think within the last hour or so. And I know some of the other uh, people in the audience uh, live today are, um, as they put it, fans of um, Eric Olander's work. So um, he is quite well known in the China and the Global South uh, circle. Um, what he's talking about today is um, certainly building on the, the broader coverage he's done for a number of years, but it also links to the broader international landscape of how China is relating to the Global South and, and how it's competing with other uh, major powers. So the title of his um, talk today is China's Strategy of Great Power Competition in the Global South. So welcome to Eric Olander. Well, thank you, Adam, and, and thank you to the Nanjing Center. I've been uh, a huge fan of the Nanjing Center going back to when I was in college, and so it's really an honor for me to be here today uh, to, to speak with you about a topic that I think is critically understudied and underdiscussed in the China-watching space. Um, in Europe and the United States, there is just a shocking, glaring absence of nuance when it comes to what China's doing in uh, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and uh, you know, around the world that is not focused on US, China, Europe, China, and China domestic issues. So this is going to be a great opportunity to kind of dive into some of these things. What I'd like to do today is really just lay out a few of the key themes of Chinese great power competition dynamics in the global south. And I'm going to run through each of the regions in order to provoke some discussion for us, because I'd really, I'm gonna try and not make this a lecture and I'd like to get to the conversation as much as possible. That being said, um, the more interactive, the more dynamic, the more contentious our conversation is, the more enlivening it will be. So please feel free to raise your hand on Zoom or even just interject. Um, I think I can see the hand raisings going on on Zoom and I'd love to hear uh, what you guys have to say and, you know, throughout the conversation. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, there we go. I think you guys can see it, correct? Are we good? Okay. Um, let me, again, I'm just going to run through. This topic is way too big, way too nuanced in order to be all-encompassing. So I'm going to pull a couple of thematics out. And and I just I don't want you guys to walk away thinking that this is the definitive answer as to what China is doing in the global south vis-a-vis -vis the great power competition. Nonetheless, these are some of the major themes. Uh, again, one of the other things that I want you to do is to leave this discussion more confused, more muddled, less clear, less certain about what China is doing in the global south, because too often in the U.S. discourse, certainly, including in the European discourse as well, People have come to a lot of hard and fast conclusions about what China is doing, and a lot of those are based on either incomplete or faulty narratives. And so, again, I'm going to try and inject some complexity into this. 
One of the key trends that we're seeing here in Vietnam, for example, which is emblematic of what China is doing elsewhere around the world, when Xi Jinping comes to Vietnam sometime in the next two weeks, uh, it is predicted that he's going to try and get the Vietnamese to sign on to the Global Security Initiative. This has been a push for the past two years in earnest, but prior to that, it started really when the Obama administration rejected China's appeal for a greater share and a greater stake in the International Monetary Fund. China then turned around and said, listen, if you're not going to give us the room to move in the international system, then we're going to create our own space. And what's happening now is there is this burgeoning alternative parallel governance architecture. It's not a one for one like the kind of the discussion that happens in the United States is that. Uh, China wants to replace the United States. There is no indication that that is true. China does want to create more room in the international system for it to move and maneuver. It also wants to weaken the Western-led international order. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about the Gaza war. But we're starting to see the emergence of these relatively strong institutions. So again, don't think a one for one, but there are some interesting parallels between the World Bank and the AIIB. And when you consider China's lending experience globally now, uh, $170 billion just to Africa alone, in many ways that dwarfed what the World Bank was doing, um, we, we have some indication that they're starting to learn how to manage these multilateral development initiatives. So the AIIB, again, is Chinese initiated. They will claim it's not Chinese led, even though it's heavily Chinese influenced. Uh, the new development bank is the BRICS bank. Uh, again, not a good parallel with the IMF, but it's a parallel institution that they're trying to channel the BRICS into. $50 billion is not a lot by the measure of the IMF, but nonetheless, it is a burgeoning institution that it wants to be in a multilateral setting. And the BRICS itself, um, in many ways, uh, is similar to the WTO in that it's, it's, you know, the WTO being, for the most part now, rendered useless and neutered. But the BRICS is this separate parallel system that they want to set up. In many ways, I've been saying that the BRICS does nothing other than channel grievances. And in that respect, uh, it's a very important institution because grievance-based politics is the coin of the realm today, as we know in the United States, in Europe, even in China. Grievance-based politics are very, very important. And I suggest that the BRICS has really accomplished very little other than being a forum for grievance, but that in and of itself is significant. The major initiatives, though, coming out of China in this kind of expansion of this parallel governance architecture are the GSI, GDI, and GCI. So that's the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiative. Now, all of these at this point are still nothing more than aspirational. Um, they haven't done anything. They don't represent much. They haven't achieved anything, but they are a blueprint. Um, and I think if you look at the speed with which the BRI moved from you know zero to a trillion dollars in under a decade, I think there's good reason that we should have confidence that China can execute on these things if it chooses. We are seeing here in Asia that there is a very big push behind the GSI. In some respects, the war in Gaza is accelerating that because there is growing disillusionment with the Western-led international rules-based order. And so these new mechanisms are finding great appeal in the Global South. For the Global Development Initiative launched at the, I think it was the 76th UN General Assembly a year or two ago, there were more than 70 countries that sent foreign minister or deputy foreign ministers to the inaugural meeting at the UN on the sidelines, 70. The New York Times did not even send a reporter. And this thing happened right in their backyard. And so these institutions, uh, as imperfect as they are, as aspirational as they are, are slowly starting to take shape. And they are center stage in Chinese diplomacy with countries like Vietnam and others. You will see in the bottom of the print of all the readouts from Xinhua that there's always the mention of either GDI, GSI, or GCI. So this is something that we don't take too seriously, but they themselves are taking very, very seriously. We have entered a new phase in the BRI. Um, this is something that's relatively misunderstood. Uh, first of all, when it comes to the BRI, the aid data report that came out a couple of weeks ago is absolutely essential reading that looked at 21,000 different uh, BRI contracts and from that extracted 
a lot of insight into the past of the BRI, which tells us where we're going into the future of it. The future of it, as we've been told now, is we're now in the Xiao Armei era. Xiao Armei roughly translated to small, moreover, beautiful. Uh, that is the literal translation. We've heard small is beautiful, small and beautiful, small or beautiful. Chinese stakeholders themselves do not have consistency, but the two things that we do know, small, beautiful. <laughs> And so what small means is sub $50 million projects. Uh, there's a focus on profitability, that is turnkey projects, so telecommunications networks. Uh, we're seeing you know, green energy networks. Anything that you kind of light up, money starts coming in the door. The days of them funding $6 billion railways in Kenya are gone. Uh, even like, you know, infrastructure projects like sewage systems are not going to happen anymore because of the debt sustainability issues in the borrowing countries. However, smaller projects can fit under that small category, which is sub 50 million up to 100 million. We started to see quite a bit as well. The beautiful projects. Now, those are different. Those have two criteria that are very important to uh, to consider. Number one is that they align with Chinese political objectives. So that is one of the reasons why here in Southeast Asia, you may see railways still continue to be built at multi-billion dollar loan packages because those align with Chinese geopolitical priorities to further bind Southeast Asian countries with China. Uh, beautiful is also that they are environmentally sustainable or that they have the full backing of the host country multi-stakeholders. So the Chinese now are reaching out to a broader set of stakeholders oftentimes now than they used to do when it was just a small coterie of elites. So if we start to see indigenous populations, environmentalists, and these other groups that the Chinese are getting better, by the way, at engaging, that could qualify under beautiful as well. More diverse funding sources. So it's not only coming from the policy banks or the central government. Today in our newsletter, we focused on a development deal between Shanxi province and Tanzania. Uh, so we're seeing Chongqing, Shanghai, these large municipalities start to exert their own foreign policy and start to get involved in funding initiatives. The Kinsuka power station, for example, in uh, in, in Kinshasa was funded by the, uh, the China Exim Bank, but executed by Shanghai Power. Uh, we're starting to see trade shows from Shandong province, again, Shanxi, and many of the other provinces, particularly here in Southeast Asia, Yunnan province is playing a much larger role. So subnational actors are taking on a larger role. And in the China-Africa trade in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to Hunan province, which is by far the most ambitious and so far very successful in that. And again, aligned with new priorities, Many of those new priorities do relate to great power competition. Uh, so we're seeing again the, the you know we're, we're going to talk about very quickly in terms of you know the scale of trade is enlarging. So for example, we're seeing in Africa a real decline in interest in doing business. Whereas we're going to Brazil, you're seeing uh, Russia. These are places that can export in large quantities. Uh, the gas deals done with Qatar are huge in scale. So scale is now very, very important to the Chinese, whereas prior in the early stages of the BRI, they would do much smaller deals, but those are getting more complex. Connectivity has always been a hallmark of the BRI and remains a hallmark of the BRI. When Qatar and Saudi Arabia uh, were at, you know, at each other and they were at sanctions on each other and relations were, you know, were cold and broken, the Chinese stayed away from Qatar. Within days of Saudi Arabia re-engaging Qatar, the Chinese got back in there, Qatar being a connectivity zone, linking in terms of gas supply lines, also relations throughout the broader Gulf, uh, Kenya being a hub for connectivity. So the, the areas that have good infrastructure for either geographical connectivity or in the case of UAE, uh, just positional connectivity in terms of being a center for uh, geopolitics, for commerce, for trade, for aviation. So th those connectivity hubs are going to remain a key priority. And those countries that do not have connectivity, you will see continue to be shunted to the side. And then increasingly, security is framing everything, uh, particularly in supply chains. We're seeing that the securitization of supply chains and to protect them against anticipated U.S. sanctions in the event 
of a conflict with Taiwan is something very much on the minds of Chinese policymakers. Uh, this is one of the reasons why there's continued investment in the China-Pakistan economic corridor and now the China-Myanmar economic corridor. Then I say now only because Myanmar is in a state of re rebellion and flux. And that is a concern to Chinese policymakers because they've invested considerably in these overland routes connecting China to the Indian Ocean, part of a much larger ambition to reduce their Straits of Malacca dilemma and to securitize their supply chain. So they learned from the Ukraine-Russia war that they need to think about this. This is happening quite quickly. So in terms of the regions and where things are coming and going from, energy increasingly is coming from the Gulf. It's no longer coming from Africa. Uh, early on in the 2000s, 30% of China's imported oil came from three African countries, Sudan, Republic of Congo, and Angola. Uh, by you know, 2008, uh, 2018, that number had shrunk to just 18%. This year, less than 10% of Chinese imported oil comes from Africa, and that is declining even further. Uh, oil now comes from Brazil, to some extent the United States, believe it or not, still. Uh, certainly the Gulf. Iran is a supply, major supplier of oil through UAE and Malaysia. That's laundered. Uh, but again, that's part of the securitization and the scale that we talked about earlier. Food is increasingly coming from Brazil here in Southeast Asia, the European Union and the US. Uh, there are a number of think tanks in China that are advocating for a dramatic reduction of sales of food from the US because they don't want to be reliant on the US for food in the event that a conflict breaks out. So that's one of the reasons why you see the shift into Latin America and South America more and more for food, and certainly here in Southeast Asia as a major food supplier to the Chinese. Metals, uh, clearly this is the race of the, of the day, which is the battery metals. And there was new legislation that passed on Friday from the White House that put this right into, or new regulations that passed, I should say, that put this at the forefront. Indonesia is where nickel comes from. Lithium comes from Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. That's the ABC and the lithium triangle. And of course, the DRC for cobalt. Um, the Chinese have a dominant role in the refining and the mining of many of these minerals. Uh, also, just last week, the Chinese put new restrictions on graphite. Uh, that's making automakers in South Korea and Japan, as well as the US, increasingly nervous. Uh, but that's where there's coming from. And timber is ASEAN, Russia, and to some extent, Africa as well. Now, here in Asia, I'm going to walk through some of the regional trends, and then we can get to our discussion. We're seeing two very divergent trends take place. So on the one hand, there's closer economic integration through RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, you're seeing trade volumes steadily rise, particularly with Southeast Asia, uh, but at the same time, underneath the surface of trade, there's enormous geopolitical tension and security tension, most notably with what's going on right now in uh, the Philippines and the South China Sea. Uh, I'll, the, let's not remember, not forget that the PLA now is on, on full alert on the border with Myanmar uh, and also in the border with India, which we'll talk about as well. You know, tens of thousands of Chinese soldiers have been massed there. So there is this dichotomy in terms of more economic engagement, but at the same time, more security concerns as well. ASEAN, more than anywhere else in the world, is where it's happening. Vietnam is ground zero for that in terms of the great power competition. So we have seen just in the past six months, uh, you know, Vietnam has elevated its diplomatic ties with the United States. It's elevated its ties with Japan. Uh, and in fact, you, you know, it's just did Japan last week, and then she is coming in two weeks. And so few other countries get that kind of prominence from the great powers. And in many ways, one of the things I've been talking to senior level African stakeholders who are struggling to figure out how to manage these great power rivalries and the dynamics, I say, look to Vietnam. Few other countries in the world have had the kind of experience that the Vietnamese had in managing the rivalries and playing one off each other. And a best example of this is when Prime Minister Chin went up to see Xi in June over the summer. He docked a U.S. aircraft carrier, the U.S. Ronald Reagan, was docked in Da Nang that same weekend. You know, I mean, that is that's the kind of hardball politics the Vietnamese play. Or two weeks before Xi is supposed to come, 
that, you know, President Trung is up in Tokyo, not only upgrading diplomatic ties, but also signing a security deal with China's kind of most serious rival. Uh, I mean, it's hardball politics that the Vietnamese play. And I think there are real lessons that others can learn from how the Vietnamese are managing the rivalries. When it comes to trade, the Chinese have an insurmountable advantage over the United States because our politics right now have made it impossible, as we've seen with the implosion of the IPEF deal just you know two weeks ago at the APEC summit, that we are incapable of now facilitating any type of open or preferential market access to the United States. Our, polit just, our politics just don't support that. By the way, on both red and blue sides of the aisle, so it was Sherrod Brown who was going to, uh, that's a, I, I think he's a Democrat, correct me if I'm wrong, but he torpedoed that, you know, Senator Brown from Ohio, but at the same time Trump was saying that he was going to kill what he framed as TPP2. Uh, and the polling right across the, the aisle and, the you know, suggests that Americans just don't want free trade deals specifically with Asia. So China is at a huge advantage on trade, it's trying to get into CPTPP. Uh, it probably won't make it into CPTPP just because of the, the high bar that it needs to cross, but you can see that it's angling to leverage on its uh, it's kind of its win with, with RCEP. Um, and then we have to talk about India. Uh, this is, a, this is the, a, just a giant hot mess. I mean, we literally have no journalists in each other's country. There are no flights between the two countries. The Chinese still have not appointed ambassador to India two years after the last ambassador Sun left. Uh, there's been no substantive progress on the border talks, even though they report tiny little incremental advantages. The tensions between these two sides are real uh, and they're mounting. And in fact, I mean, when you hear the rhetoric from the Indian side, there is no concessions whatsoever that are in the forecast. And with Modi going up with elections next year, don't expect any, you know, dialing back on his side. She has made it very clear that he cannot compromise on the border because if he compromises on the border with India, he's then going to have to compromise on the South China Sea or elsewhere where there's territorial issues. So there's, there were, were, there's no off ramps in any of these policies. The Indians have been cracking down on the Chinese on tech. Uh, the Chinese have been complaining that it's unfair, but at the same time, the Chinese have made it equally inhospitable for, for Indian stakeholders. And, and this, this, this stalemate just doesn't show any signs of abating anytime soon. That's the fundamental reason why I don't believe that the BRICS is worth anything in terms of substance if these two countries can't agree and there is just zero trust right now between them, between those two. Uh, and again, with elections at least, you know, in, the, in next year, for at least the next year or maybe more, uh, we're not going to see any progress there. Now, this map is the map that I love the most. And, and I'll share these slides with you. This comes out of a UK geopolitical uh, think tank. And what it does is it shows how the US and its allies and its security partners have effectively encircled China. And so this notion that China, and, and th that she has even said that he feels entrapped and encircled, uh, there's legitimacy to it, except with Central Asia. And that's what I call the US escape hatch. So if you'll, you'll see that in Central Asia, there's really the US alliance doesn't really carry there. So it's one of the reasons why the Chinese look at Central Asia with particular importance, because whereas they face this overlapping web of security alliances in its east, south, you know, Southeast Asia and then South Asia, because India being a member of the Quad and given the relationship with India being what it is, uh, Central Asia is a space where they're unencumbered. Uh, the U.S. is, I don't think, has any more bases in Central Asia. It had bases in Uzbekistan during the Afghan war. Those aren't there. So in many ways, it has room to maneuver in Central Asia more so than it does anywhere else in, uh, you know, on its periphery. Uh, it also has special meaning for Xi Jinping. Remember, she, um, you know, he, he announced the Belt and Road in Central Asia. His first overseas visit after a COVID was to Central Asia. He brought the Central Asian's leaders in the C plus C plus five to come uh, to come to, to Xi'an this year. Uh, he has a particular affinity to this part of the world. 
And, and, and that does drive, I think, part of their outlook that there's a lot of potential in Central Asia for infrastructure development, for transport, for natural resources. But most importantly, he also sees this as a pathway and a gateway for China to access Europe by rail. The Chinese are constantly going on about how, how many tonnages of rail have been, of products have been shipped by rail to Europe uh, via the, 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 those rail lines. And so those all pass through Central Asia. And so they see that as a very important gateway. Uh, I cannot uh, overstate how important Central Asia is in terms of geopolitical significance today. So the Middle East now has changed considerably in the equation. Uh, China for a long time was a buyer, but not engaged in the Middle East. Uh, that has changed dramatically. Again, she did go to Saudi Arabia. I think it was a second trip after COVID. Uh, you know, he was warmly greeted by MBS. MBS has been, the crown prince has been very effective at pivoting a, away from the United States uh, and towards China, at least publicly. The U.S.-Saudi oil relationship remains intact, but politically, uh, it's contentious on both sides. Um, it's misread by many people on the outside that, you know, Americans, for the most part, don't really want to do business with, with the kingdom. Uh, it's untenable after the Khashoggi killing and, you know, and it's just it's a sign of glaring hypocrisy of the United States on human rights policies and others that we know we will sanction Uganda for LGBTQ issues, but at the same time, never issue any sanction against Saudi Arabia for its treatment of women, minorities and others and for what it does in terms of Islamic terrorism. So there, you know, the, the duality has never sat well with the American public and continues to be a very awkward relationship. China doesn't face those limitations. It has leaned in hard into the kingdom. When we talk about China in the Middle East, and every expert we've spoken to says the same thing over and over again, forget about Iran, forget about Israel, the Gulf countries, Saudi, Qatar, and the UAE are the priorities for energy security and also increasingly for legitimacy. In legitimacy, we talk about when Saudi Arabia backs China's policies on Xinjiang, when Mohammed Abbas comes back out of the ballot from his visit into the as the Palestinian Authority president and endorses Xinjiang, when you know Al Sisi, uh, you know in Cairo, the heart of the Arab street, endorses China's policies on Xinjiang. This grants China a legitimacy that is more impactful than it'll get almost anywhere else in the world. Very, very important. In terms of the Gaza war, uh, it's both good and bad for China. It further undermines the notion of a U.S.-led rules-based international order. China is exploiting the hypocrisy of the United States that it criticizes uh, Russia for bombing civilian targets, but says nothing when the Israelis do it in Gaza. Increasingly, as the global south is, is, is just rebelling against Israel, by extension, they're also rebelling against the United States. That plays very well for China's desire to, to, to really you know, push back on the US-based rules-based order. That being said, if this war spreads, uh, it could complicate the Chinese initiatives quite a bit. China can ill afford right now higher oil prices. So if the war becomes a regional war and that impacts the cost of oil, that would adversely affect the Chinese. Uh, so there are it's a delicate balancing act for the Chinese right now in the Middle East where they want to push but at the same time, they want this thing to get over soon enough. Mark my words, the day that this war is over, the Chinese will be lining up to rebuild Gaza. So they see opportunities there as well. Finally, the Mideast is increasingly the new focus of this new BRI we were talking about. Uh, Saudi Arabia was the largest recipient of BRI funding last year. Increasingly, we're seeing deals all over the uh, the Middle East for BRI deals, much more so than in other parts of the world. Again, that connectivity is really important. In terms of Chinese diplomacy on the, uh, the Gaza war, it shifted initially from being centered in Beijing, where Wang Yi you know, responded famously. It took him a week after the October 7th attacks to respond. Then the Chinese sent out their special envoy, Jai Jun, who is really in many ways just an empty suit, uh, he didn't. He had. He just kind of went on a listening tour. He really didn't do anything. He just. There was nothing that came out of it. They ended up restating their old positions on the issues that they're neutral, that they don't. They want a two-state solution. And then last week, Wang Yi closed out China's presidency of the rotating presidency of the United Nations Security Council with a rehash 
that was literally copied and pasted from 2021, which looked almost like the same statement in 2014. The reason why people were unimpressed with what China's done on the Middle East is because if you heard Chinese statements from March of this year all the way up until October 6th, you would have believed that China is the second coming for Mideast diplomacy. Because it did the final brokerage of the Iran-Saudi uh, detente, there was this narrative put forth in Chinese media that they are now the new arbiters of peace in the Middle East. They even talked about you know, brokering a deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. They, they talked about you know, getting involved in some of the Houthi conflicts. I mean, there was no end to their ambition. And so it's kind of a little bit of a shock that they went from being that to being now recycling position papers from 10 years ago and having no new ideas. And what really people are saying is that if you want to be a great power in the space of the Middle East, you can't just talk, you actually have to bring some ideas to the table. And at this point right now, the consensus is emerging is that the Chinese are just way, way over their heads in the Middle East. They don't have the language skills, they don't have the network, they don't have the contacts, they don't have the relationships and the leverage to actually broker any kind of meaningful peace. But more importantly, their think tanks and their universities are not generating the kinds of innovative policy ideas that, that Wang Yi could actually bring to the table that would be fresh or new. So all we get is a rehash of what we've already known, which hasn't worked. And for the most part, the Chinese have been relegated to a second tier status in, in this process. And I think they like it that way. That's where they want to be. Very quickly, we're going to wrap this up, looking at Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, this is one of the most important relationships that doesn't get enough attention. They do almost twice as much trade with the Americas as they do with Africa. Uh, food and energy, and then increasingly critical minerals are the, are the big drivers of this. But there's a second part of this is that the Chinese in the early 2000s were reluctant to make their way into the Western Hemisphere for fear of kind of upsetting the United States. Uh, they don't have that concern anymore. As we see with the construction of potential spy bases in Cuba, uh, we also see a potential military outpost. I don't call it a base, but certainly a military outpost near the Antarctic in Argentina. Uh, these are all the discussions that are happening there. Uh, also, it is a it's the last major battleground for Taiwan uh, recognition, uh, you know, and so this is this is one of the spaces where the Chinese are becoming increasingly active. I think they take a little bit of pleasure that the United States just gets wrapped up into a ball with anxiety when they see the United the, the Chinese influence going up in terms of trade investment. It's a it's a countries like Brazil are major markets for uh, particularly for tech products, even like BYD, Tencent, Alibaba are major investors in Brazil, and uh, but the politics are are not easy. So we just heard two weeks ago, President Lula from Brazil kind of threw a real diss towards China, saying he was trying to protect Africa against being, quote, taken hostage by China. Now we see new president-elect Millet in Argentina turning his back on China in many respects, withdrawing from the BRICS, leaning into the U.S. Uh, so it's complex. But the Chinese have a very, very skilled diplomatic staff in the Americas. They speak Spanish very well. They know the region well. They've been there for two or three decades now studying it. They have the roots in terms of the anti-colonial kind of narratives that have worked very well in Africa. And uh, and they're big buyers of, uh, of, of Latin American products. And so when we saw the Chilean president at the Belt and Road Forum just smiling ear to ear, um, you can kind of see the traction that the Chinese are getting in the Americas. And again, the goal is to turn the last remaining 11 countries, many of which are in the Caribbean and Central America, and one in South America, Paraguay, uh, to kind of have them abandon Taiwan and eventually come to China is also a major part of the objective. Africa, last one. Africa is uh, in a declining priority for the Chinese. It's becoming much more of a political priority than an economic priority. On the right here, you probably can't see the detail of it, but let me just tell you that these are the trading regions of around the world. Africa is smack dab at the bottom. Out of the $7 trillion or so, $6.7 trillion that China does in global trade, $282 billion is done with Africa. 
Now that sounds like a lot, but it's about 3% of China's total global trade, which by any measure is insignificant. That's a rounding error. So Africa is not important to China economically, but China is very important to, to many African countries, but not all. China's trade with Africa is highly distorted. 62% uh, of all exports come from just three countries. Uh, for the most part, the Chinese don't do a lot of business in most African countries. Uh, most African countries will buy quite a bit, but sell very little back. Uh, the fact is, is that Africa doesn't have a lot to sell China other than the strategic resources in cobalt, lithium, coltan, tantal, and manganese, and some of those that go into EV batteries. But the oil, mineral, and timber that China used to get from Africa, it now gets elsewhere on the Belt and Road. What China wants from Africa, though, that it can't get anywhere else is a block of votes in international fora that the African delegations tend to vote more as a group than any other region in the world. So at the Food and Agriculture Organization last year, when China's candidate went up for re-election, the African delegation was squarely behind him and pushed the American candidate to the side because the Americans were never going to get the votes. That's the second time at FAO that's happened. Many of the mid-tier mid UN agencies, it's the same story. Same thing on Huawei. The Americans are 0 for 54 in persuading an African country to abandon Huawei. On World Health Organization issues related to COVID, the, the African delegations took the Chinese side. Over and over and over again, we see the African delegation aligning behind the Chinese on sensitive political issues. That matters a lot to the Chinese. So the Chinese relationships in Africa are now more political than economic, but that is something that is not very well understood by the African delegations themselves. Uh, trade, investment, high-level visits are all down. FDI is down you know, dramatically by four times this year from last from the previous year. Trade again, relative to China's total growth, trade at $282 billion, even though it grew in absolute terms, in relative terms as a share of China's total global trade is flat or declining. And the key issue right now with Africa is debt restructuring. The Zambia talks just fell apart. Ethiopia is underway, Ghana is underway, but that's one of the major topics of discussion. Okay, I tried to get through that as quickly as possible so we can have a really good discussion. There's my email, I'll keep that up for a little bit. Um, we have our sites in French, English, and Arabic, and would love for you guys to check us out. So uh, let me just leave that there for now. Wow. So thanks. That's a lot of a lot of ground covered in a yes. relatively short time. So Boom. I guess we can we can open up for questions on on any of that. There's many many things that might prompt thinking about. But who wants to get started? Don't be shy. I had to provoke someone to say something. I would have failed miserably if I didn't provoke anybody to do something. Okay. Okay. Ellie. Ellie, Ellie. you have your hand up. Um. Hello. Yes. Um. So uh, we've actually, we just, um, in our financial crisis class, we just had a paper on the BRI and debt restructuring. Yeah. Um, and earlier this year, we also had a talk from uh, a PhD, um, or a PhD presentation um, about the BRI lending, um, often beginning from uh, Chinese companies who are trying to find um, demand for their excess supply. Yeah. And uh, so the last month or so, there's been a lot of news about how China's manufacturing um, is declining. And if, as, as output for all of this excess supply decreases, do you think that will have an impact on uh, BI lending because there's less excess supply to find uh, sources for? So that was the original, I mean, when people look back at the origins of the BRI, they said the excess capacity was one of the main motivators for the Chinese to kind of look abroad. Um, th th there are a couple of different trends that are going on right now, which may challenge that narrative. And again, I, I'm not going to give you a definitive answer because I don't know if anybody can give a definitive answer, given the lack of transparency into the decision making as to what motivates BRI policymaking. That being said, a couple of different trends are happening right now. The China plus one strategy, which is ostensibly what 
the you know, US and the West and Japan are doing to de-risk their investments in China is something that the Chinese themselves are now embracing wholeheartedly. So you're seeing, for example, the Chinese move manufacturing closer to the markets that they are actually serving. So BYD is building factories now all over the world. Is BYD going abroad to build those factories because it's got excess capacity at home? No, it's building it because A, it wants to protect itself against possible future sanctions from the US, but B, the economics of it makes sense to build factories and reduce shipping costs. And you, you know, and it, again, the economics makes sense to build locally. We're getting a BYD factory here in Vietnam next year as well for that reason. So, so I think there's there's a couple different trends that are that are coming together at the same time. The China plus one, the securitization of um, uh, of the supply chain. So, for example, in Indonesia, uh, and this is a country that I would argue is probably the most important country in the EV battery metal race. Uh, Geely just manufactured its first car this week. Uh, there now that means that they are eventually going to build an entire vertical supply chain in Indonesia from mine to manufacturing of electric vehicles. Nickel, cobalt are mined there. They're going to do refine. They're already refining there. They're going to build a build a battery processing center there. Is that excess capacity? Maybe, but at the same time, I think it just makes logical sense for them to build and to distribute their, uh, their manufacturing abroad. Increasingly, though, with the CHIPS Act and now the new EV battery metal act that came uh, battery metal regulation that came out of the White House, uh, they're going to have to move their manufacturing and, and conceal it in such a way that it doesn't meet the 25 percent threshold that the United States imposes to prevent it from uh, from coming into the U.S. So, again, there's other reasons that will then provoke them to move their manufacturing overseas, to hide it under shell companies, to kind of do joint venture partnerships, and to try and conceal their traces so that they can circumvent more and more of these regulations in the U.S. So my only advice to you in terms of these, these theories is it's probably not any single one of them, but a combination of all of them that are acting together in unison there. That make sense? Yes, thank you. Oh, cool. Uh, Luke. Hey, Luke. Hello. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. Um, sorry to uh, maybe drag the conversation back to American politics and the dismal state uh, that we, we love have it. going on. <laughs> but uh, I th and I don't want to shock anybody, but I think I may have spotted a contradiction in American politics. Uh, it's, it basically, Americans are so worried about China. Uh, getting more involved financially in other countries, but at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, they don't want free trade agreements. They don't. They don't like to see that at all, according to polling. Uh, so, uh, is there any room uh, for, in America to use the, kind of the popularity of grievance pol politics to change that back back uh, the other way around? Because I feel like it was kind of grievance politics that turned Americans very much against. Uh, free trade agreements. You know, we had Trump saying we're, we're out there getting taken to the cleaners by all these other countries. Uh, I think, you know, maybe the free trade is not an unmitigated good uh, for Americans, but I think Americans have lost sight of a lot of the benefits that they have reaped from from free trade uh, and and maybe the benefits of having a, a, a bigger share uh, in, in what's going on there. So uh, any room for that? And, and then also maybe how how does China, how are they using grievance politics to their advantage uh, in the, the way that the U.S. apparently cannot in this in this realm? Well, they're using the, So let's start with the second question and then go to the first one. The second question is that Chinese grievance based politics. And and again, the Chinese come to the international system with a massive, massive chip on their shoulder. Uh, you know, the center of humiliation, this this this, this constant sense of that they're everything is framed by their interactions with the US. We, we, we profiled, for example, this scholar who was talking about China DRC trade. And the first thing out of this scholar's mouth in her, in her paper was, you know, we're better than the United States. Uh, you know, the, the accusations that the United States has about debt trap diplomacy, the United States, you know, says this and says that and says this, and nothing is about the DRC itself. And you see this over and over again with the Chinese that they, they, they have a real difficult time you know, just interacting with countries absence grievance. And it's really one of their shortcomings. I, I was in a meeting last week in Johannesburg with um, with the senior leadership of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. 
And they came to the South African Institute of International Affairs, and I was just there at the time, so I got to join the conversation. One of the first things out of their mouths was, well, the Americans complain about debt trap diplomacy. And I said, stop, stop. You know, Coke doesn't talk about Pepsi every single time Pepsi complains about Coke. The debt trap issue is settled, okay? The research is definitive. It's on the front page of Google that it's been debunked by Chatham House, by Boston University, by Johns Hopkins, by, you know, you name it, like six or seven research institutes. The State Department itself doesn't use it. Only the elite polit politicians in the United States still continue to use it. But you continuing to talk about it keeps it alive, okay? So stop, stop, move on from it, okay? And, and just, you're caught up on this. And they were like, huh? Yeah, we, we never really move on from it, right? Oh, okay. That, that's a good idea, you know. Um, and so, but they, they have a hard time because you read Global Times, you look at Chinese scholarship, so much of it is infused with, you know, well, the United States tells us we suck, so therefore we're better. And I'm just like, you know, God, you just almost wish they would get out of their own way and be able to have bilateral relations with different countries absent the United States and not framing everything against the West and the United States. It would do the Chinese a world of good to move on from this, this kind of grievance-based politics. That being said, they are marshalling the gross hypocrisy, the duplicity of the international system, the rules that apply to the United States and to Europe that don't apply to the rest of the world. They are marshalling that collective anger that people in countries where I live and in South Africa and else have had enough. They are fed up with it. And the United States keeps showing up and keeps talking about the rules-based international order and preservation of it. And that is a backward-looking vision. And it is fascinating how American diplomats are flummoxed by this. Why don't they see why the rules-based international order is really a good thing to preserve? Okay, And then you start talking to them about unsanctioned drone attacks in Somalia. You talk about Libya. You talk about even Kosovo, which was not mandated by the United Nations, not to mention Iraq, Afghanistan, that when it suits the West, to, to abandon the rules-based order, they do often at the price of the Global South. And then the Global South is asked to line up behind the Americans when they want them to at the United Nations. And Americans clutch their pearls with shock, shock, when, you know, when it comes to Ukraine votes or Israel votes and the Ameri or Xinjiang votes, and the Americans are, you know, have no coalition of any kind behind them, okay? The Chinese have done so so well at doing that. And the, the idea that the United States is somehow a defender of Muslim rights around the world, okay, and then says, you know, turns around and says, well, why don't you line up with us on Xinjiang? Uh, it's just incredulous. I mean, no one believes it. And so I think the Chinese have been incredibly effective at marshalling that rule, th that kind of grievance from other countries. That's why the BRICS is incredibly important. I look at the BRICS in much the same way as Hillary Clinton's deplorables comment. And we ignore the deplorables at our expense. She was so arrogant about Donald Trump's large constituency of voters who felt alienated from the system, who felt that they had nothing from it, that the system was never giving them anything. And the same is true with the BRICS. They look at the rules-based order and they say, it's crapped on us for 50 years. Why, what do we get from this system that you speak so highly of? And so when it comes to trade, you know, the Americans, I don't think are going to budge. The politics in our country today do not support free trade, whether it's from the far right or the AFL-CIO on the left. There, there's no constituency right now. Not even the U.S. Chamber is advocating for this anymore uh, There's because they know it's a losing issue. Um, there's no constituency for free trade. So Americans have tolerated higher prices on their goods imported from China through the tariffs. It it makes no sense to me, uh, you know, that they that because Americans apparently did not understand that the Chinese are not paying the tariffs. We as consumers are paying the, the tariffs. So there is a breakdown in the logic. There's a breakdown in the culture of free trade. We no longer represent a country that advocates low tariffs, uh, open markets. That used to be us. That is not us anymore. And there's no indication that it's ever going to be us in the short-term future, especially if Donald Trump returns to power again. Um, and American consumers are delusional slash naive slash ignorant, thinking they can get a Walmart t-shirt for 99 cents 
which is at the benefit of free trade and globalization without free trade and globalization. Um, that's just, uh, you know, you and when you sit over here in Vietnam, which manufactures now most of the stuff that goes into Target and Walmart, um, you kind of, you know, you see it firsthand that we are paying the price on the environment over here. My AQI today was 150, okay? And yet the Americans are lecturing the global South at Dubai and the COP28 about, you know, just transitions. Okay, there's that duplicity that shows up again in the in the discourse, and trade is a part of that. Did I answer? Was that good? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, the only quite, thing I would add animated. is, uh, uh, yeah, the only thing I would add is uh, I wouldn't want to be the American politician who has to tell the uh, the Gen Z that they have to pay t double for their Shein clothing that uh, that they've been enjoying but, for so cheap. I for know, so but that's what we thought when Trump put the tariffs on, and yet. There, Here we have there. Iowa farmers saying, I'm going to kill my business in order to, you know, to boycott China. And, you're, you know, you know, cats are flying. Do you know what I mean? Like you would assume that's the case. But yeah, I mean, Sheehan is, is we'll see. I mean, that's the ultimate test. Uh, Vivian. Thank you so Hi, Vivian. much. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I am such a fan of your work. I've been listening to Pan Africa Project, and I'm um, and so excited to see the expansion. So I am so grateful that you're here. Um, thank you, Adam Webb, for doing this as well, and everybody else that was involved. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. A lot from stemming from what you were just talking about in terms of um, this kind of like loggerheads with politicians and and thinking really. Um, across the board, it's not just politicians, but it's actually civilians sometimes as well as on both sides in China and Africa. Is there, I hate to say this, but like an algorithmic um, version that you can think of that would um, kind of release the tensions that would that exist now and are foreseeably in the future? And that leads to my second question. I know this is about the global south, but there is a lot more concentration on the Arctic these days, especially the connection between China and Africa, uh, sorry, China and Russia um, yeah. with respect to um, LNG. Um, and how does that play in the global South? Thank you. So is there an algorithmic? No, I mean, that, that would be a simple answer to say yes. Um, what I wrote the other day about the conflict, the tensions that are mounting in the South China Sea is that None of the sides, the U.S., the Chinese, or the Filipinos, have given themselves off-ramps. And again, this is maybe the, the nature of our politics today, that again, the Indians and the Chinese haven't given themselves off-ramps either. There's no flexibility in it. it. Everything is this extreme absolutism. The Chinese have repeated their statement, not one inch. Well, when you make that statement, what are you going to do? Then the Filipinos are saying, we're not backing down. We're never going to concede You know the, you know, the second Thomas Scholl. Uh, okay, well, what's up if you concede even then even a tiny bit of compromise, you're screwed. And then the United States comes in instinctively and automatically and says, we are going to implement the 1952 M Mutual Defense Treaty, Security Treaty with the Philippines. Well, once you've said that, you can't back down from it. So again, I think this is typical of the dynamics that we have today increasingly, is that our politics on all sides, and this is where the Chinese and the US in many ways have similar politics, which are populist driven politics, which refu which re really remove the nuance of diplomacy that we had in a pre-digital age in another era where there were off ramps, where you could speak quietly in back channels, where you could have these conversations. And, and we just don't have the space to do that. The fact, I mean, think about how low the bar is. The fact that at the Xi Biden meeting, the thing that they wanted to establish was the military to military hotlines again. And the Chinese saw that as really giving something to the Americans. They didn't see it as an essential thing for them too. It's just, I mean, if if we are just, if that's where we are, imagine what you're trying to say, Vivian, about a broader type of easing of tensions. You know, the Chinese feel that it's an optional thing to have a phone to pick up in case there's a military conflict in the South China Sea. We're in a bad place. And let's not overstate it. We're in a bad place. And the thing that worries me the most is that the populist politics on both sides really have an enormous amount of influence in the process. And, and that's that's disconcerting, again, the fact that we don't have these off-ramps that one would hope that in diplomacy would be there to allow for this diffusion of the tensions. 
what was your second question? Um, it had to do with um, the strengthening of the Arctic partnership between the, the U.S. Partnership. So yes. this is really huge for the Chinese because they, you know, first of all, and this is the benefit of their close, you know, all, uh, what's the name of their thing with Russia? You know, their their never ending relationship with Russia. What I forget the name of it, what he said with Putin, but uh, access to the Arctic has been a long time ambition for the Chinese, uh, not only for the, you know, again, the, the, the energy is one part of it, uh, but I would say the energy is secondary to the transit. The shipping lines and again they are remember that map i showed you of southeast asia of you know china feels surrounded so if it can if it can get around uh you know that blockade potential blockade in southeast asia or the south china sea or the pacific through the arctic to get goods out to to its preferred trading partners that becomes vitally important to them so as the arctic disappears um, I think the shipping lines to me are going to be far more important than the the oil and the gas. Again, there's I think they're getting quite a bit of oil and gas, abundant amount from Russia over land through their pipelines and increasingly through uh, their, their their Middle East suppliers that that they're not too concerned about that. Whereas I think shipping shipping lanes become more important when you see the U.S. security net around them in, in Asia. Just um, my just guess, totally speculation. Okay. Uh, just one one follow-on question with that. Like, how um, do you have a read on the claims that they're there for climate change? I mean, I, I work in disaster response, so I know that we also in the U.S. as well as in China have experienced a lot more natural disasters. And a lot of people are saying that that is due to climate change. Is that happening also in the global south that you're seeing? Is that a concern? Oh. I mean, listen, we are, I say we, because I live in the global south, but I'm not, you know, I'm a privileged, I have privilege in the global south, but People in the global south are bearing the brunt of the climate change, uh, you know, the price. In fact, they get none of the benefits that you get in the north for enjoying all of the the energy, you know, emitting, you know, and you know, luxuries that you have in Africa and and Southeast Asia. We're looking here at des at salination levels in the Mekong Delta rising to the point where the they're forecasting the end of rice production for a part of the world that that feeds over a hundred million people. I mean, this is, I mean, the, the consequences of what's happening in the global South are tragic on a monumental level. And, you know, in Africa in particular is, you know, contributes 3% to global emissions, but yet is suffering drought, fire, flood, uh, you, you know, and that's causing all sorts of dislocation. So the, the price that's being borne by, by the global South is enormous. And China too, by the way. Uh, China, though, is producing vast amounts of coal based, coal based energy to offset the the droughts that are impacting hydroelectric and whatnot. So, you know, it's been rough in China as well. And they had fires, severe fires. They had drought last year in Southwest. Um, it's, you know, China is very vulnerable to many of the, the climate uh, catastrophes that have been afflicting the country for, you know, millennia, but are just intensifying in power. So, but the problem is, I, I am one of those who's not optimistic that we're going to reach any deal, uh, because India and China don't see the trajectory the same way. And the Americans, and the, I mean, I was talking to a Canadian diplomat uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they say the Americans, Canadians, and the Europeans say the same things, that the Europeans, that the Chinese and the Indians are the largest polluters. On an absolute basis, that is absolutely true. On a per capita basis, that is not true. And also the other issue is the fact that history did not start in 2020. We are paying the price today for a hundred years of Western industrialization. And there isn't any accountability of that in the West. It is as if, you know, climate change just started a couple of years ago. And so that's again, feeds back into this grievance based politics we were talking about that you're, you know, the just transition, so to speak, you know, the just energy transition is, you know, billions of dollars of loans to developing countries. So they're profiting from it in the form of interest and not rectifying the situation that they themselves created. That is the sense of a lot of people in, in these countries of like, we didn't create this mess, we're paying for it, and now you're screwing us with a bill. And, and so, but I tell you, talk to US, European, and Canadian diplomats, they don't get it. They just don't get it. I don't know what to say. I mean, they're just... It's it's crazy the disconnect, you know. Does that makes sense. Um, Zoom user, whoever you are, Zoom user. Anonymity. I think that's me. 
Sorry. Hi, Zoom user. Um, yeah, that's me. Oh, I'm. I don't know why it says that. Okay. Well, my name is Haley. I study Hi. um, um, meant resources and energy at HMC. Um, and uh, uh, I did want to say, I think something that you pointed out, like in particular, is actually um not enough people invest attention into it because I think perhaps because India moves a little more quietly than some other countries relatively on the political sphere but um it is the alignment of India with Taiwan recently um where they they I think they just sent like a they did a policy where they sent a whole bunch of skilled workers over to Taiwan and New Delhi had a had a, a, a Taiwanese flag um, being waved downtown through a festival, um, which is what I'm curious about because you talked about, uh, you talked about China feeling suffocated, right? Feeling like it's surrounded, but India is, is a little bit more complex with that. So the India by a lot, you know, by alliancing with Taiwan potentially if that's what it is doing moving in the in the shadows a little bit they're alliancing with with America in that way um but it's complicated because I would be careful of using the word alliancing that that's a strong diplomatic word right so oh am I breaking up I can't tell if I'm breaking up or if he's no. breaking up go ahead it's a little choppy oh, but I'm not sure if that's me or you Okay. Let's see. I think we, okay. Oh, there you, okay. There you are. I break up. Okay. Yeah, keep going. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. So I was just going to, I don't know where you last heard, but um, I was just saying that, you know, India is a complex wild card in, 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 in China's affairs because they are allied with Russia. Um, they're throwing hints over to Taiwan and obviously China has shown that they are a no compromise entity when it comes to Taiwan. So um, what potential do you think that this holds for the future? Because, you know, it is Central Asia and it so leads to the Middle East. I would be very careful with your language because th these words mm -hmm. matter. They carry a lot of weight. So allied and alliances, right. things like that. India is 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 famous for pioneering, uh, you, you know, its independent strategic autonomy. Uh, and again, the, even mm -hmm. in the Cold War, they were never a reliable partner of either the Soviets or the Americans or others. You know, they always are very independent. And today, uh, you know, more so than, you know, they will turn to the United States and join the Quad, but at the same time, then buy lots of oil from Russia at the same time. I mean, they're very <laughs> unpredictable in that. So they're really, you know, pursuing a, a strategic autonomy to the nth degree. I think their engagements with Taiwan are similar to what they did in, they joined for the first time in ASEAN military exercises as well, naval exercises. They donated two uh, ships to the Vietnamese, which again is also seen as a, a move counter China. So I wouldn't, I think this is part of a, a bunch of chess pieces that they're playing, but one by itself is not mm -hmm. more important than the other. Um, I think their engagement with Taiwan is a very small engagement. Taiwan is insignificant to them, uh, you know, economically. Taiwan is not important to them geopolitically. But again, it's just another way of pulling the, the, the dragon's tail, of annoying the Chinese. And that was what that's I put in the same category as the Vietnamese engagement, as the ASEAN engagement, as well as the, um, you know, what they're doing there. These are pretty small engagements overall. I think if you put, you know, you, you, you bring, you know, Narendra Modi into a corner quiet room, give them a nice drink. And after three cocktails, he'll tell you, yes, I would prefer to have the relationship with China lower stress. I'd like it to go back to normal. The problem is, is that BJP politics just don't align that way. And China didn't help itself with the issuance of the new uh, border map that came out last year. And I mean, they put a line down and they said, basically, this territory is ours. And the, the Indians will not reset the relationship until those talks, you know, are on the table about that border. But the Chinese can't negotiate the border because that will look like they're making a concession. And that's not the nature of Chinese politics, certainly under Xi. 
So, you know, but I wouldn't read too much into the Taiwan thing. That is far afield for, for, for India. More important to India is the Indian Ocean. So they just committed $5 billion to spend to build a new second aircraft carrier. The Indians are obsessed with Chinese growing influence in the Indian Ocean. And the election in the Maldives was very important where the new Maldivian uh, president or prime minister, prime minister, you know, basically said, I'm going to lean towards China away from India. That's what they're most worried about. Don't pay too much attention what happens in the Western Pacific. That's not as important to India. The Indian Ocean region, Sri Lanka, that area is where they, the, the, the real battle is for influence with the Indians, obviously, aside from the border. Um, and then there's also this both claim the mantle to be leaders of the global South, which is kind of a ridiculous statement to begin with, but uh, both kind of claim the mantle. One is a more open democratic one. The other one is a more kind of effective, you know, authoritarian model, but both claim legitimacy as, as the leader of the global South. And you see that battle kind of being waged as well. But for the most part, again, the Western Pacific, I think is of secondary priority for the Indians. So do you think that this, Sorry to continue, but that this battle between India and China is a battle of legitimacy, but that's a little difficult because India is legitimate and India doesn't have to prove that, you know, its rule is legitimate. So is China, by the way. But China has to prove that its rule no, it is doesn't. legitimate. Why does China have to prove? Why does China have any less legitimacy than India? Um. There's been a lot of talk about the legitimacy of Xi's rule in particular. By who? When you say there's been a lot of talk, that's American talk, right? Scholars, but also not just among scholars in the West, also among Chinese people themselves. Uh, I, I cannot tell you how many conversations that I've had about people who have debated the legitimacy of Xi in particular because he in a way is described almost like a trust fund baby. <laughs> like he didn't earn his way necessarily through politics, but he, you know, it, it comes based off of his family's background. You know, he's not a military general. Um, he's not like, uh, um, what's his name who just died, who came from a poor peasant family in Anhui and like really scratched his way up. You know, so there, there is this sense that she has to prove his legitimacy. Well, you are, you're tapping into very sensitive territory here because there's uh, other people would contend, <laughs> you know, legitimacy in Chinese politics is a whole, you can do a PhD on it and still not get to it. But the fact that, you know, she is the son of Xi Zhongxun uh, and the fact that, you know, who was a close advisor to Mao Zedong in many respects gives Xi as a direct linear connection to the revolution uh, legitimacy that others don't have today, and those those princelings in in the in the elite circles of Chinese politics oftentimes carry a certain legitimacy of royalty, much like the Kennedys do in our circle as well. Uh, but in terms of elites being born into power, um, I'm not entirely sure that Europeans or Americans have an enormous amount of credibility in criticizing the Chinese, given the fact that you know. Johns Hopkins did away with legacy admissions, but most other Ivies have not. And we 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 rebreed our elites too, based on lineage. I mean, you know, so yeah, I'm not defending the Chinese no, here. Not. I'm just not entirely sure that that criticism is legitimate. Um, okay. And, and again, this is a uh, open for debate. There is no right or wrong. So, you know, this is the spirit of this discussion, but it's hard. But again, the problem is, is in, in China, public opinion on Xi's legitimacy is impossible to tell because they'll never legitimately poll on that. And you you really can't tell what the body politic thinks. Impossible to know for sure. You know. But again, fair question though. Uh, Nathan. So um, a little bit of a slightly different topic, but also oddly related. I actually want to talk about India, uh, not India, um, Chinese-Vietnamese relations and kind of how that might have broader implications. Uh, we actually had a kind of uh, academic tour, I believe last year, uh, kind of touring, I would say touring ASEAN countries, but really we only had two, Singapore and Vietnam. Okay. And during our talk in Vietnam, uh, we talked a bit about kind of like 
interactions between party and state. And one thing that kind of came up, and I guess one thing that one of the big takeaways I had uh, from some of the lectures and some of the discussions we had is that Vietnam uh, is that, well, first of all, uh, uh, important prior, Vietnam is also commu a communist one party state. They also have a, it's also a party state with the communist party being led. Now, once that obvious fact is out of the way, one interesting aspect of Vietnamese Chinese diplomacy is that you can have state to state diplomacy and you can also have party to party diplomacy. And one interesting aspect about Vietnam is that these two can be very dynamic aspects. Totally in terms different. Of, totally yes, different. exactly. Exactly. Totally different. So while you might have a stronger, just, just to make things basic, you might have a strong anti-China stance from the state side, you can have, the party can kind of serve as a back way right. to do that. So that is an important part in terms of Vietnamese Chinese politics. But that is, I don't want to say unique, but that's also somewhat unique to, well, I don't want to say it's unique not all countries that are interacting with China have a similar path. So I'm kind of wondering, you mentioned earlier in this talk how a lot of African nations could perhaps look at Vietnam as an example or a lot of other nations in the global south. Mm. I, I agree with that, but not every nation will have a kind of, will have a, a have an equivalent, will not be able to rely on party to party relations. No, Vietnam. No. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. So the, the fundamental difference between China and Vietnam, and many people will make the equation that you did, which is, well, Marxist, Leninist, communist state, you know, one party rule, party over the state, you know, the structure. Wow, that looks very similar. Uh, but in, in, in truth, the dynamics between Vietnam and China are totally different. So whereas in China, power is consolidated in Xi. He is the chairman of the Central Military Commission, the general secretary of the party, the president of the state. And he's then, you know, how many other titles she has could fill a book, okay? But power is really consolidated around him in many respects. It's not absolute power, as we all know. China is a very large place. Provinces have power. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sorry, if I could just clarify my question. Uh, yeah. Clarify my question. Um, I, my, my understanding is, like, very, very like, I believe we're on the same page in that respect. Chi uh, Vietnam's part, kind of party state well, relationship is very different than China's party state. But it has five. What I was going to get to was that there are five power centers in Vietnam. So you have the general secretary, the president, the prime minister, the head of the National Assembly and the head of state security. Right. Though, and the Chinese have been incredibly sophisticated at playing each of the power centers off each other. And so and that's why you can see this schizophrenic foreign policy coming out of the Vietnamese. Where on one hand, you'll see party to party ties very good, but domestically, there'll be a very strong anti-China sentiment or out in the Paracel Spratly Islands where they still have territorial disputes, the army will still be complaining about the Chinese. So it feels very kind of scattered uh, for them. And that's that's again. But right now, at the current moment, the general secretary of the CPV uh, is the power is, is the strongest force in the country. So the party to party ties are driving things today more than anything else. And that is that's the key thing to take away from where we are today in Sino Vietnamese relations. That being said, you can see the Vietnamese really hedging their bets against the Chinese in major ways. Again, the upgrade with South Korea, Japan, and the Vietnamese bringing the Australians, the Indians on board. These are all very provocative kind of challenges to the Chinese, very provocative. And again, the key question now is China going to up the ante this week or next week, whenever she comes, by trying to get the, the Vietnamese into the GSI. Uh, that would be a major thing for the Vietnamese because them being part of a Chinese security architecture of any kind um, is something that, remember, Vietnam was colonized by China for a thousand years. Uh, so when the Chinese say we've never invaded another country, you've got to be like, excuse me, uh, Vietnam disagrees with that totally. Um, and remember, the last war that that China fought was with Vietnam. So there are there's a lot of ambivalence about Chinese security relationships. Uh, but there are some very good reasons that the Vietnamese may want to join that if they can get the right concessions from the Chinese. I see. If I can add just one other follow up. Um, what are some broader like the V? I guess what lessons could other uh i would say other global south nations uh kind of take from vietnam kind of from vietnam's 
uh, lessons, even even if they might not have, say, similar institutions or like a similar yep. relations. Number one, you got to know your strengths. So this is the problem with African countries that we're seeing across the board is they still think that their strength is what comes out of the ground, is the is, is the resources. That's not their strength because China can buy those resources pretty much anywhere except the cobalt in the DRC. So the strength for African countries is their politics. The Vietnamese are very good at leveraging their strengths, which is their geographic location. Again, they're you know hosting the Americans, hosting the Chinese, and really playing politics in their diplomacy, saying, I'll support you on this if you support me on that. And too often we see you know, stakeholders from other countries uh, go into negotiations with the Chinese and just kind of give themselves up. And, and they don't negotiate. They don't push back. And so one of the other things is that China literacy in Hanoi is taken very seriously. You have some really good China scholars and China think tanks and China policy <laughs> in Hanoi. You don't see that in other countries. I mean, you just don't see them taking China seriously in the Americas, in the Middle East and others. They're not generating the scholars. They don't have programs like Nanjing. They're not generating you know, legions of, of, of young people like you who are studying China. That's just not happening in other parts of the world. And it happens in Vietnam quite a bit because they recognize that their future is tied to the Chinese. There's no way. So just one little, I'll give you a quick little anecdote of a story. I, I befriended a very senior Vietnamese foreign ministry official a couple of years ago. And I said to him, I went out I went out for lunch with him. And I said, isn't this amazing? This was when John Kerry was, was Secretary of State. Our two countries in our lifetime, in my lifetime, our two countries at war. And now look at us, we're best friends. And he's smoking kind of profusely as they tend to do. And he says, you know, Mr. Eric, he says, don't get too excited. I said, why not? This is it. I mean, trading partner, you know, investment, all these great things were happening. He said, I'll tell you the way we look at it in Hanoi. He said, you know, mistresses, mistresses are fun. You can do things with mistresses that you can't do at home. And I'm kind of thinking, okay, well, where is this going? And he says, but Mr. Eric, mistresses come, and mistresses go. Today, you're here with us. Tomorrow it might be the Japanese, maybe the next day it'll be the Koreans. And then he points up, which was presumably north. He said, but the wife is always there. And that's the thinking for China. Their foreign policy orients around China. And you hear this discussion in the United States all the time of like, are we gonna pull Vietnam to our side in this, in this tension? Never in a million years, because they are bolted to China. So, as bad as the politics get, they're going to be very deft at negotiating with the Chinese to survive. And they have to survive. They depend on the Chinese for water. They depend on the Chinese for electricity. They depend on Chinese to buy dragon fruit and mangoes and, you know, and beech nut and all these different things. So at the end of the day, their leverage is going to be geopolitical. It's not economic. The Chinese can cut the water off anytime they want. And Vietnam is in very big trouble. So again, the complexity of the relationship between Vietnam and China is enormous, but at the same time, it's anchored always around China and not about the other great powers. We just can never lose sight of that. Hey, Max. Uh, Max. Hey, uh, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, I'm Max, I'm a recent HNC graduate. Uh, so anyways, the question I wanted to ask was maybe like one to two questions was, uh, one you mentioned that, which I thought was interesting, is that a lot of countries would consider U U.S. rules-based order as backwards. Yeah, um, backward-looking, so backward-looking, not backwards. It's okay. a backward-looking vision. Okay, I was wondering if you like, based on that, um, if if you think there's a a newer evolved like U.S. foreign policy that might be more palatable to no, other countries. This is the problem. I mean, this is the fundamental problem is that the Americans are not coming to the table with the kind of offers that other countries want. So we will come to country X and say, don't use Huawei. And country X then says, okay, what do you want me to do? Well, the Americans don't have an answer to that. They don't have state-backed development financing. We don't have our own 5G equipment. And this is typical of the problems we're facing. The Chinese will come and say, we're going to give you preferential market access to the largest consumer market in the world. The Americans can't offer that. You know, and this is the real problem. When we uh, when we talk about U.S. foreign policy in Africa, we say, what was the last innovative policy that the United States introduced in Africa? It's not power Africa. 
It's not Prosper Africa. These have all been busts, okay? It was PEPFAR 25 years ago. We have this idea that in the United States, okay, and, and you hear this anxiety constantly on Capitol Hill of like the Chinese are moving into the Americas, the Chinese are moving into the, you know, they're taking over trade in Asia, the Chinese are dominating in Africa. And the question is, what is the American offer on the table that's engaging to a developing country? Because every president and prime minister in Africa wakes up with one thing in mind, jobs, period, end of story. When you have the median age in Africa is 19.4 years old, and there's 65% youth unemployment in South Africa. Okay, we come to the table talking about all of these different issues, civil rights, political rights, human rights, all these different things. Okay, that's not on their agenda. Their agenda is one and one thing only, which is jobs, because if they cannot provide employment to this incredibly young population, that population becomes very restive. And the most dangerous thing that exists in humankind today, okay, is an unemployed young man, okay, because they cause trouble. And, and this is the problem is we are not bringing solutions for that to the table. Our ideas are still old, anchored in the 20th century. Our processes are old. Our whole governmental system is not up for the fight that we're up against with the Chinese to mobilize state capital to execute projects, you know, quickly. Okay, there's a there's a, an old saying in Africa that says, in the time that it takes to negotiate a loan with the United States or a financing deal, the Chinese already built the road. Okay, that ability to actually deliver and execute is a problem. We also have a messaging problem. When Wendy Sherman, the Deputy Secretary of State, the previous Deputy Secretary of State, came to Vietnam, right down the street at Fulbright University, and she said, our main priorities in the Indo-Pacific are health and climate. And the Vietnamese young people at Fulbright University said, bullshit. They got up and they said, "Ms. Sherman, where were you when we needed you during the pandemic? Nowhere, okay? And then they said the next question, "Ms. Sherman, Aren't, isn't the United States the largest oil and gas producer in the world? How can you be a leader on climate? They're not even buying it anymore. Okay. We are so accustomed to our toxic brew of politics where we can say anything on Fox or on CNN and people just kind of go, okay. And then they move on. Well, in other parts of the world, they still actually listen. And when they hear people say these kinds of things and not follow through, okay, Biden told Africa last year at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit that he was going to make a trip to Africa this year. We've got three weeks left in December, three and a half weeks left in December. He's not going, okay? The amount of empty promises that the United States constantly makes global South countries, now people are saying enough. And so if we don't have a substantive offer behind what we're doing, then people just aren't going to take us seriously. Now we see in Asia, the, the IPEF collapsed, which is supposed to be the economic engagement strategy, and people are just like, forget it. I mean, the Vietnamese prime minister was caught on a hot mic laughing at the Americans in Washington, okay? I caught on a hot mic laughing at us because there was $150 million or something like that for 10 ASEAN countries over five years. They're not serious, they're not serious. And so that's the big problem here, is that there's a substance versus a perception issue. And our substance just isn't there when it comes to following through, particularly in direct competition with, with the Chinese. And I'm not saying the Chinese are doing everything right. I'm not saying that the Chinese are, you know, 10 feet tall and perfect, okay? But one of the things that the Chinese are doing is delivering tangible outcomes that a lot of people can feel and see and touch. And that is something that is very important in this part of the world where tangible outcomes are very difficult to come by. Makes sense. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I guess we can take one more question. Since hey, we're Benny, last time. one. Uh, Benny? Yeah. Hi. Um, sorry. Okay, there you go. Hi. Thank you um, for this amazing talk. So my question is a little bit, I guess, not traditional. I wanted to focus on, um, talk about soft power because um, I, th I think a week, uh, it's been just a week, I read an article in the New York Times about how student exchange um, 
between the US and China is declining. Meanwhile, um, that of uh, the US and Africa is skyrocketing. I personally know a lot of students from Africa who are actually studying in China. I'm taking Chinese now. My Chinese teacher has taught in two African countries and she's currently in Italy where I, I live. So um, how does the, the prospect of maintaining that soft power diplomatic um, endeavors between uh, whether it's China and the global south or uh, China and the U.S. and I guess in, in accounting for how the U.S. is feeling in many ways. I, I know a lot of us, again, African students who it's very hard for them to come study in the U.S. because of visa issues or because I used to work at an international center at my school. So uh, I have first uh, hand account of talking to students who are not able to come because of those issues. How do those all play into um, the dynamics of how both the U.S. and China um, view their partnership with countries in the global south, especially um, countries in Africa? So the, the problem is that the United States still frames soft power really in the context of Beyonce, Starbucks, and kind of McDonald's. And, and, and that's a little bit of a mistake here because a lot of these brands, you know, the famous saying, you know, that in Japan, the little boy says, mommy, daddy, do they have McDonald's in America? Uh, these brands have become so globalized that they're not even associated with being American anymore. And furthermore, you can also have this phenomenon where, you know, a kid can smoke Marlboro's, wear Levi's, have a, have a latte from Starbucks in his hand and still hate our guts. So there's no correlation between, you know, buying American consumer products, listening to American pop culture and, and kind of whether they align with our values, which is the ultimate Joseph Nye definition, is the ability to persuade people to do things uh, in, in non-military or non-kind of coercive ways. So I wonder if American soft power is as strong today as a lot of people think it is based on the old traditional definition. Uh, that being said, the reservoir of goodwill that people have about the United States is deep around the world, that even with all of the messed up stuff we have in our country, particularly in Africa, where the mistreatment of African-Americans is all right through their YouTube and social media feeds, where you know all of the, the shortcomings of our society in our race relations figure prominently in their media narratives and whatnot. Still, you survey young people and they would like to come to the United States and they think the United States is a land of opportunity. And it's remarkable how you know, again, there's this reservoir of goodwill for the United States. That, that And it's not just because the United States is a wealthy country and they want to move to somewhere else. They do like, you know, democracy has a lot of appeal in Africa. Uh, very few people would say, I want to move to China if they had the choice between the United States and China. And that speaks again to the, to the deep reservoir of goodwill. That being said, uh, the Chinese in many ways have repositioned soft power um, in terms of you will look at, I have a Twitter feed of every Chinese embassy and, dipl and diplomat in Africa, and it is just a litany of infrastructure porn, one after another of, look what we did in our, you know, 25 years, you know, 40 years of development, you can do this as well. That narrative of, we were as poor as you 45 years ago, and now look at us, carries enormous power in Africa, because it shows people that it's possible. And, and that's really important. And in terms of the educational initiatives, this is where, you know, the Chinese have done an enormous good for Africa by educating almost 700,000 young Africans. Africans have failed miserably to take advantage of this, okay? Miserably. That these young people come back from China with advanced degrees in, in Chinese and they speak fluent Mandarin and virtually no government and companies take advantage of it. So what ends up happening is they disappear into the economy, never to be heard from again to use their Chinese skills. You know, I scolded a group of ministers jokingly and politely, but I, you know, they said, well, we don't have the resources in our governments to be able to have a better China foreign policy. I said, shame on you. Shame. You guys have 60,000 young Africans went to China for 10 years and continue to go. And what do you do when they come home? Not from the right family, not from the right tribe, not right from the right ethnicity, not from the right schools. And they sh shoo them away. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. And so, so Africans themselves have to do a better job at taking advantage of this precious resource in the form of the education that young Africans are getting in China. Danny, you had a follow-up comment? Or not? Uh, yeah, I just uh, had like a follow-up and I know it's like time to wrap up, but um, I guess how 
um, how do you, I guess, convince people or whether it's like uh, policymakers in the US or um, politicians in, in Africa? Um, a lot of the sentiment in uh, Africa, not like, I, want, I don't want to speak uh, generally for the global south, but specifically in Africa, because I was born and raised there, lived there for most of my life before moving to the States. Um, is they, they want, like you said, the tangible things that they can see, like the road and things, but the ideological side, a lot of that did not necessarily align with the ideology that the Chinese uh, government, in when it comes to um, uh, Africa, uh, tries to promote. Uh, again, specific, I have specific examples, because like I said, I have um, relatives who work for uh, companies in, in Africa that is run by Chinese employees and they don't necessarily align with the ideology or the things that they push, but that's the, the only means that they have. Like, and the United States or other countries that they may rather want are not um, necessarily aligning with that. So how do you convince them to um, sign on to like an initiative that the US might promote? You mentioned how Biden said he was gonna go and never went. I mean, the vice president, the first lady went, we all saw what came of that. Um, but how, how do you kind of try and change the narrative, whether in D.C., well, about how they treat Africa as a whole, not like a backyard or hand-me-down compared to how China treats Africa? Well, I mean, that, let's not let's not overstate. China, you know, I guess I pointed out all the numbers are pointing down from China and Africa. OK, so trade investment. So let's not put China on the pedestal of Africa right now. And remember, when. You know, everybody will talk about how, you know, the United States invests in bombs and China invests in roads, okay? That is such a BS line. The United States pumps in $11 billion of humanitarian assistance every year into Africa. China doesn't even come close to that. So to suggest that China is somehow, you know, doing these wonderful things in Africa and the United States is not doing anything is not true. These bipolar type of narratives break down pretty quickly. Um, you know, so, so first and foremost, um, it's been 25 years for the, since the Chinese engaged in Africa in the modern era. Um, there's been no indication whatsoever that Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, you know, the largest, most vibrant democracies on the continent have taken any inspiration from China's political system. The Nigerian press is still as chaotic and dynamic as it's always been. They're not modeling themselves on the Chinese model. What they're doing, which what a lot of developing countries are doing, is they're being very selective. We want this from this partner. We want this from this partner. And as President Aike Ndehishilema of Zambia said, when I'm with the Chinese, I'm focusing on the Chinese. When I'm with the Americans, I'm focusing on the Americans. It's not an either or thing. OK, so I think that African countries are taking inspiration, like a lot of countries, Vietnam the same, from all the different powers. And I don't think we should try and box them in, not saying that you're doing that, but that we should box them into are they either you know, aligned with the U.S. or aligned with China, because that narrative just doesn't work. In terms of what I do personally, and I hope you'll join me on this journey, is I try to provide a baseline of, of neutral, nonpartisan, nonpolarized information that African policymakers and, and U.S. policymakers can, can reference and just try and stick as close to the facts as we possibly can and try and break down the extreme polarization of, uh, of the narrative so that people can make more informed decisions. That's the only thing I can do, but I'll tell you, I feel like, you know, I've got an umbrella and a typhoon. I mean, you know, I mean, the polarized narratives are so, it's so depressing because I see on YouTube, you know, people with these crappy shows and these crappy takes will get 100,000 views. I did a really sober analysis of China's role in the Zambian debt crisis, and it gets 300 views. The algorithms don't want this kind of content. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's the reality. Most of us don't want this kind of content. When you look at your own content feeds and what you what you zero in on, you know, we're all guilty of it. But that's, I think, the more that we can kind of push the, the understanding to the center and, and the moderate voices, the better we're all the better the world will be. It's an uphill fight, though. That's a very good note to, to wrap up on. Th thank you very much, you know, Eric and, and our participants for I think exemplifying how many sort of multi-layered issues there are that we can have this kind of lively exchange about in this uh, virtual space that we that we're fortunate to have with modern technology despite this being is wonderful scattered all over the world so uh, we certainly hope we can continue uh, collaborating in the future and, and having more events um like this so, so thank you very much for coming and um for, for those of you who are interested you can certainly look up more online about um, eric's ample work uh, the china global south 
uh, project. Um, I subscribe myself and a number of other people in the audience do. Uh, too. And it's I have a student a, discount. Very, very here, interesting uh, feed. And as a student okay. discount, yes. That's right. And then I put my email there. So if you guys uh, want to follow up and have any questions, please feel free to uh, to let me know. And I'll put, you know, just stay in touch anytime. It was great to have this conversation. And those are the student discount links if you'd like to sign up. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for coming. Thanks so much. Have a good night, guys. Bye-bye.